Okay, members, the sitting is resumed. It is an honour for me to pay my respect to the family of Seamus Mallon, who passed away last Friday. This honour more do almost a horch the clan Seamus Mallon or a was Hinya. Frequently in this assembly, we focus on our differences as political opponents in a way which disguises the underlying respect we have for those who put themselves forward to seek to improve our society. We have an opportunity to demonstrate that respect today as we express our condolences on the passing of the former Deputy First Minister Seamus Mullen. I said on Friday evening that Seamus Mullen was a towering figure in our politics. That was clear before this assembly was established. He had already demonstrated his commitment to public service as a school principal, but was then motivated to fight against injustice in the political arena in the civil rights era of the day, and as a long-standing deputy leader of his party. In this chamber, we should also recognise his record as a parliamentarian of distinction, whether in this assembly, Westminster or in Shannon Aaron. That reputation was built partly on his personality. He certainly was his own man, with strongly held views, but he expressed them passionately using his talents for a pithy turn of phrase and his dry wit. There are only nine of us remaining in the current Assembly who were elected alongside Seamus in the first Assembly in 1998. And from the perspective of recent political difficulties, it is sometimes easy to lose sight of how far we have come. But when you look back to political relationships in this chamber in 1998, we have travelled a significant distance. It was a challenging time to become one of the first holders of the Office of First and Deputy First Minister with responsibility for leading the institutions, but he held his high record or high regard nonetheless as a straight talker and a man of integrity. When you look back at the hansards of those early days, there were those two themes he highlighted that remain particularly relevant today. Firstly, he knew that the diversity of political opinion could be a source of animosity, but that being inclusive could offer huge potential that a way could be found to work together. Secondly, he was clear that debates and legislation might set a lead, but that it was mindsets and attitudes in the community and in the streets which were central to taking us all forward. In 1998, Seamus Mullen and David Trimble welcomed Bill Clinton to the Waterfront Hall. In his address, Seamus set out that the road to the future is always under construction. In recent years, he made no secret of his personal frustration that greater progress had not been made, but developments over recent weeks give us the chance to continue along that road. This afternoon, we recognise the huge political contribution made by Seamus Mullen, and I want to give my condolences to his party colleagues in the SDLP. However, we are, of course, mindful that a family is in mourning. Family was important to Seamus Mullen, and one could not fail to have been moved by his account of putting the care of his wife Gertrude above seeking the leadership of his party. So as I conclude my remarks, I want to express the sympathies of this Assembly to Seamus' daughter Orla, his son-in-law Mark, his granddaughter Lara and his sisters Maura, Jean and Kate. We hope that in time they can be com comforted by happy memories and their pride in his legacy. Suvnis Siri or Ananam Usul, eternal rest on his noble soul. Right. As customary, I will now invite party leaders to speak for about five minutes to pay tribute to our late friend and colleague. I will then call members as they rise in their places. I will not be imposing strict time constraints, but I do encourage members to be brief, no more than three or four minutes, if they possibly can do, to give time for as many possible in the hour allocated for the tributes. When the tributes have concluded, members are welcome to join me in signing the Book of Condolences in the Great Hall. The Book of Condolence will be available for members and staff to sign until the close of plenary business this evening. It will be open to the public from 10 a.m. in the morning until 5 p.m. on Friday evening. The Assembly will now pay its own respects, and I call on Nicola Mallon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The recent history of Ireland, and particularly Northern Ireland, over the last 50 years is characterised by discrimination, division, conflict, violence, awful, senseless killings and bombings, which only ever serve to drive us all further apart. But it is also characterised by dialogue, engagement, acknowledgement of difference, 
and of legitimate coexisting identities, agreement, and ultimately a political accommodation which has difficulties and all led us to where we all are today, which is representing all communities that live cheek by jowl in this region by being here in this house where we all have a duty to serve those people. Seamus Mallon was integral to all of what went on in this shared home place right up to the formation of this power sharing assembly. It is no exaggeration to say that without him and his influence, we would not be here today and would not be able to extol his virtues in this very chamber. Seamus was there at Sunningdale in 1973. He was there at the Shannad in 1982. His support for the Anglo-Irish Agreement in 1985 was correctly regarded as absolutely crucial. If Seamus had not deemed the landmark accord as a vehicle for extolling and advancing the position of nationalists in the North, you can be sure he would have publicly said just that. But he kept the long-term goal in mind and became a vocal supporter of the agreement. He was in the House of Commons from 1986 to 2005, where he left a mark with his passionate oratory and also in his diligent, persistent work on policing reform, where he led over 200 amendments which were part of a personal and party crusade to deliver a policing and justice system to which we could all belong and support. Perhaps more than anything else, the policing and justice structures which exist today are Seamus Mallon's lasting and enduring legacy to life in this part of the world. And he was here. Seamus believed in this assembly, in an executive and in delivering good government for all of our people. So when he became Deputy First Minister in 1998, that was a role he embraced, even at times he was not entirely comfortable. Along with David Trimble, he sent out a message that there was a new way to do politics here. Seamus and David were a pair with their own dynamic, and in spite of consistent external pressures, they did their best to deliver on the promise of the Good Friday Agreement when it was far from easy to do so. He was here. It felt to us younger SDLP members and activists that he was always here and ever present, like there was no beginning and no end with Seamus Mallon, that he just was. And at party conference time, he was always there, the very last to go to bed as he inspired a younger generation in song, in poetry, in recounting old stories. But all of that came after the serious political discourse, and that, of course, is where Seamus excelled. When he said something, he meant it, no question. And in politics, that is a wonderful legacy. No messing, no spin, no winking, no nodding. Just tell it like it is, the Seamus Mallon way. This assembly owes a debt of gratitude to Seamus Mallon. I am pleased that he got to see the devolved institutions he helped create restored. And I am pleased on behalf of the SDLP that we have this opportunity to comment on his life, his passing, and his enormous contribution to politics here. Seamus was a man of peace. He was a man of non-violence. He was a man of justice, of fairness, truth, and of courage. You can be sure that the next generation of SDLP politicians will live by the Seamus Mallon mantra. That is in our DNA. But all of us here, across all benches, would do well to remember and live by Seamus' judgment of how we share this piece of land. As he led out in his maiden speech in the House of Commons 34 years ago, we have two stark and clear choices. We can live together in generosity and compassion, or we can continue to die in bitter disharmony. I know which I choose. I know which Seamus Mallon chose. And I am forever grateful that I got to stand on the shoulder of an Irish political giant. I am personally filled with immense sadness that we will have no more visits in Market Hill. I will miss his straight talking, honest advice, but Seamus and all he stood for will continue to guide me and the SDLP family. At the requiem mass and celebration of his life today, we were fittingly reminded in the Missalette of the canton of expectation by Seamus Heaney. To know there is one among us who never swerved from all his instincts told him was right action, who stood in his ground in the indicative, 
whose boat will lift when the cloud bursts happen. I will sorely miss you, Seamus. We will greatly miss you, Seamus, and the country mourns your loss. Seamus, our wake is lat, hachara yel. I now call Arlene Foster. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And first of all, on behalf of the Democratic Unionist Party, may I first of all pay my respects and give condolences to our SDLP colleagues. And uh, they will forgive me if my thoughts are principally today with Seamus' family, of course with Orla and her husband Mark and their daughter Lara, and of course Seamus' sisters and the wider family. I want to pay tribute to Seamus uh, as a fellow member of a small band of politicians who have headed the shared office of OFM-DFM, uh, which is now the executive office, and recognise its distinct and unique challenges. As well as being Northern Ireland's original Deputy First Minister, Seamus Malm was also a Member of Parliament for 19 years and his party's Deputy Leader for 22 years. And the climate he had to operate in, of course, was very different to the one we operate in today. No social media, less 24-hour news, but decades of murder and mayhem that thankfully we no longer have to deal with to anywhere near the same extent. Seen by many in unionism as a more typical Irish nationalist than his long-term partner leading the SDLP, John Hume, but yet perhaps viewed as more pragmatic and with a better understanding of unionists. That may be as a result of the fact that he lived in Market Hill with his unionist neighbours at every turn. And he was a fierce critic of violence, something which is much easier from the armchairs of BT9 or the south side of Dublin or the Shires of England. But Seamus Mallon had to walk daily amongst the gunmen and bombers he was calling out and go back onto the streets of Newry and along the border to attend to his constituents and campaign and seek votes for himself and his party colleagues. He saw council colleagues in Armagh who sat within the same chamber as him murdered. And he sought to attend every funeral of those in his constituency who died in the Troubles, sometimes when he was far from welcome. And he recognised that nationalism needed to have confidence in and support policing. He didn't mince his words about the feelings he saw, often to the frustration of many hard-working uh, professional police officers. Seamus Mallon, who had an interest in plays and amateur dramatics, became a commanding orator with a presence in the chamber, an effective communicator valued by journalists for his quips and one-liners, and of course a key negotiator for the SDLP. He could be thran, but he could also be very thoughtful. He was committed to his local area and where he has been brought up as reflected in his recent memoir published last year, and it contains much of his experience, but does not dwell in the past, but offers insights and advice for the future. Whilst 100% in favour of Irish unity, he knew it couldn't be forced upon people and the consequences that come from wafer-thin majorities. He saw the outworkings of a close Brexit vote and the polarising effect that that had here and in Great Britain. To make a success of constitutional change, would require sufficient consensus. During his maiden speech, which Nicola has already referenced in the House of Commons, he described the two cathedrals of the Protestant Church and the Catholic Church. They look across at each other in the city of Armagh. Just as the bells tolled in the new year, I saw the obscenity of two policemen being blown to smithereens. We have two stark and clear choices. We can live together in generosity and compassion, or we can continue to die in bitter disharmony. Are we to move into the new century with a millstone of blood, as it were, hanging around our necks, with a millstone of division and sectarian bickering, with the daily catalogue of threats of violence and death, or are we to create a new vision for a new century on the basis of agreement and reconciliation? In closing, Seamus made clear he would pursue his objectives by peaceful, democratic, constitutional and political means on the floor of the House or on the floor of whatever other form is available to me, and in such a way that will not cost one drop of blood 
and will not remove anyone's self-respect from him. Now, some of those questions and challenges is from Seamus's maiden speech in 1986 remain unfulfilled today. The restoration of a Northern Ireland government and fully functioning institutions provide us with the opportunity to address them. Northern Ireland and its leaders must carry forward that vision, building a shared society where everyone has a stake and feels at home and working together in the interests of all our people. Finally, Mr Speaker, on the day we pay tributes and remember Seamus Mallon, I also want to acknowledge that this is the 75th anniversary of the liber liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau. And in that camp alone, one million Jews were put to death because of their faith, six million Jews killed overall. The scale of that hideous extermination must always be remembered on this Holocaust Rem Remembrance Day. And I stand with the Jewish people across the world as they face ongoing anti-Semitic abuse today. And I remember the horror of the Holocaust. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I now, I now call Michelle O'Neill. Can I join with colleagues right across this House in conveying my sympathy and that of the Sinn Féin party to the family, to the friends of the late Seamus Mallon, whose Requiem Mass we celebrated in Mark Hill, at Market Hill earlier today. In particular, uh, I want to offer my condolences to Seamus' daughter Orla, his son-in-law Mark and his beautiful wee granddaughter Lara, who played her part at making the funeral Mass a very beautiful and fitting tribute to her granda. The loss of um, Seamus Mallon is a significant moment in the history of this island, but it is, first and foremost, a devastating loss to his family and his friends, to his colleagues in the SDLP, for whom he was a close and special figure, and I know uh, was a very valued mentor to both Nicola and to Colm. Our thoughts are with all of you today and with Seamus' family. I did not know Seamus very well personally myself, but I certainly knew of his reputation as, a, as both former Deputy Leader of the SDLP for many years and the party's Chief Negotiator during the 1998 Good Friday Agreement, to which he clearly made a huge contribution, not only in reaching that historic agreement, but also leading the new Executive as Deputy First Minister and Joint Head of Government. Seamus served not only as a Minister and Member of the Legislative Assembly, but also as an MP at Westminster and a Senator in Leinster House. He had an electoral record which we in this chamber can only admire. In each of these roles, he used his voice to articulate the interests, the views and the feelings of the nationalist community in the North for over 40 years. SDLP leader Colin Eastwood has in recent days described Seamus as a force of nature, and I think that is very apt. Seamus has left a legacy of hard work and commitment to creating a better society and a better Ireland. He has left an indelible print on the politics in Ireland. Despite our different political outlooks, and paths challenging the British Government's presence and the causes of division and partition in Ireland, there is no doubt that Seamus and his friend John Hume helped to open up the prospects for peaceful change. We put aside party differences to effect real change for the people of our country. And I put on record our recognition and respect for the critical role played by both men and many others at that time to bring about the peace process and the courage, generosity and risks taken by them both to achieve peace here in Ireland. Seamus led a full political life in the service of the Irish people, and right into his 80s he was still making his voice heard, and even if we didn't always agree, he made sure that we heard it and that we were listening. As we mourn his passing, let those of us in this House who have formed the new executive cooperate in every way that we can so to fulfil the promise of the Good Friday Agreement to a new generation. And in this way, Seamus' contribution will, I hope, have everlasting value and never be forgotten. May he rest in peace. Gurmila Mayogov. I call Steve Aiken. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, may I rise and add to pay my respects and sympathies for Orla and the wider Mallon family? And may I then add my own words and those of the Ulster Unionist Party to commemorate the life of a great Irishman, Seamus Mallon. Seamus and our then Deputy Leader, our, our, our then Leader David Trimble, did much to see Northern Ireland emerge from the destructive and evil days of the Troubles. And while David did, did see the recognition of the Nobel Prize, Seamus, who probably deserved it as much as his leader John Hume, has only latterly been recognised. And for what an inspirational leader and politician that he was. 
Indeed, as one of my predecessors, Lord Empley, said today, there was no doubt that if John Hume was the SDLP's ideas man, Seamus was the person to turn these ideas into practice and workable solutions. I first came to know Seamus long before I got into politics, through my involvement in a whole range of north, south and east, west bodies. He was always courteous but forthright in his views, and had a fierce determination to get his point across. Although, when I became involved in politics, and he was always supportive, although a bit bemused while I would wish to get involved, as he said himself, it was catch-22. He had to be mad to want to be a politician, but if nobody did it, where would we be? But what always struck me about Seamus was his integrity, his courage, and his abhorrence of all forms of violence. As he himself wrote, I have mentioned my neighbour, Jack Adams, a good man who couldn't do enough for you, but he was shot dead by the IRA because he felt he was doing his duty by joining the RUC reserve. That dehumanisation of individuals, of a community, so they could be killed just for wearing a police or UDR uniform, that is what I will not support. That man and his family had their home here for 400 years, but he had to be killed because the IRA's little green book said so. The awfulness and nihilism of that is what I am fundamentally opposed to. I believe that 30 years of violence has meant that the Republican movement has shot and bombed itself out of the vital process of persuading people for Irish unity. While Seamus had a very different view of how he saw the future of Northern Ireland to that of the Ulster Unionist Party, we are the first to recognise that he was a statesman of the first order, a politician with that very rare quality of steadfast integrity, and someone who, along with David Trimble, believed that only by truly working together in a spirit of partnership could we make this place truly be a shared home place. Maybe, Mr Speaker, it could be his lasting legacy that we current political leaders draw inspiration from his words and decide once and for all that power sharing rather than power division should be the model we seek to achieve and make this truly a place to cherish. Mr Speaker, thank you. I now call Naomi Long. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I would like to add my condolences um, to the Mallon family, particularly to Orla, to his son-in-law Mark, um, to his granddaughter Lara, and to the wider family circle. I also want to extend sympathies to his friends and colleagues in the SDLP. As a role model for generous leadership, you can have no better. Whilst those closest to him will feel his passing most acutely, all of us in politics, indeed all of us in Northern Ireland, are the richer for his life and the poorer for his passing. He was a man for whom fairness and integrity were not just political ambitions, but were part of his DNA. His commitment to non-violence, to civil rights, were unwavering and uncompromising. I never had the privilege of serving here with him in this chamber. He retired the year that I was elected. But I did have the pleasure in recent years of sharing platforms with him on various occasions. And he had lost none of his wisdom or wit, which made him such a formidable politician and such an admirable man. While I never served here with him, I owe it to him and other courageous leaders like him that I have had the opportunity to do so, and to live the second half of my life in considerably more peaceful times than the first half. For that, I and I believe all of us owe him personally an enormous debt of gratitude. Our best and most fitting tribute to him is to work together to deliver on the promise of 1998 and the Good Friday Agreement, which was his gift to us. Thank you. And I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, and we in the Green Party would also like to extend our condolences to our colleagues here in the Chamber in the SDLP and also in the wider SDLP family. But of course also to Seamus' wife Orla, Orla and his wider family. The death of a, a husband, a father, a brother is a painful event and I wish them the strength needed for the times ahead. Seamus was a giant in the political arena. He was a giant figure. But he came from a different political era, that of the civil rights movement. 
And for me, he was a recognisable face on my television during my younger years. I did not have the opportunity to meet or work with him, but certainly his courage and his willingness to take risks were a central tenant to allowing us all to be here today in this chamber. We should all be in no doubt and be thankful for that and for the fact that it has allowed us to move on. His legacy will be long remembered and we can go far in strengthening this work and his tenacity by continuing to forge a peaceful and reconciled future for all across Northern Ireland. Thank you. I call Jim Allister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I readily join in the condolences to the late Seamus Mallon's daughter and to his uh, wider family. And no doubt, as in all deaths, these are very difficult times and the thoughts and prayers uh, of many of us are with them. I also extend the same uh, sympathy to his political family, uh, the SDLP, uh, where uh, he was such a giant figure, uh, a mentor to many, and will no doubt be long and sadly missed uh, in those quarters. Seamus Mellon, as a constitutional nationalist, was someone that I could respect, no matter how much I disagreed with some of the things he had to say. And some of those things I did disagree with. His denigrating of the UDR, for example. But the fact that he advocated only constitutional means and explicitly condemned without equivocation terrorist violence earned him respect across the community. Sadly, the late Seamus Mellon's repudiation of IRA terrorism has, not, has only been replicated by one of his successors in the office of Deputy First Minister, namely Mark Durkin. And that, of course, is a pointer to the evolving of these institutions that he helped to shape to their evolving in a retrograde direction. For all his eminence as an orator and as a straight-talking, even hard-hitting politician, at the end of it all, he appears to have been and was a wholly devoted family man. The love and devotion which he committed to his late wife is well documented and much respected, and I think speaks greatly to the strength and the character of the man. He too, of course, is unlikely to be forgotten, nor should he be forgotten, in political circles, for as he was a politician, faithful to his beliefs. Thank you. I call Jerry Carl. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I just wanted to say a few brief words uh, and to put on record on behalf of myself and uh, people before profit my sincerest uh, condolences. Uh, to the family and, and friends of Seamus Mullen, to his colleagues in the SDLP and to everybody who, who knew him. He was obviously active in politics for a long time here, for many, many years, and today there is a big amount of grieving and loss today across our community. So I just wanted to raise to put my thoughts with all those people who are grieving today. Thank you. I call Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Seamus Mallon would not have claimed to be impartial. He exalted his beliefs clearly and honestly. He was an Irish Republican in the truest form. 
Mr Mallon, however, had capacity and heart to recognise that others did not necessarily share his beliefs, and rather to seek to undermine their views from the outset. He sought to understand and respect. He was emphatic and looked for humanity, the greatest yet rarest qualities of political leadership. I did not know Mr Mallon, but recently I was taken by words he said regarding unionism. Irish republicanism has to look into the unionist heart and the unionist mind. Mr Speaker, I have never heard that before. And in saying so, he did not dismiss my belief. He did not discharge an important part of who I am, nor did he wrongly characterise me because I did not agree with him. Rather, he wanted to know me, and I appreciate that. Indeed, I believe it is the fundamental principle of the Good Friday Agreement, not to be neutral if you're not, not to deny who we are, but rather embrace ourselves and each other. Learn, live, and love together. I can only speak for myself, but certainly in this unionist heart and this unionist mind are people. And I expect from much of what has been said about Seamus Mallon, that's what we would find in his heart and mind too. Different, but the same. I wish to express my sincere condolences to Mr Mallon's family, friends, and all those who knew him in particular members of the Social Democratic and Labour Party. Thank you. I call Jocelyn McNulty. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My sincere sympathies with Orla Mark and Seamus Mann's little princess, Lara, his sisters Jean, Kate and Maura, and his wider, friend, his wider family, his friends and his neighbours. Of course, Marie Hart, who has spent many years caring for him, and for Gertrude, who has since passed, or long past recent years, and Brendan, his gardener, who he spent many, many hours with in the greenhouse. I want to pay tribute to and thank the players and members of O'Donovan Ross at GFC, Mother Brack, the community of Market Hill, the Mid Armagh branch, Mid Armagh Seamus Mallon branch of the SDLP, Seamus Mallon's family and friends and neighbours who volunteered an extraordinary effort in ensuring a beautiful and fitting farewell. It is questionable if all of us would be here today if it were not for the work of Seamus Malm. Last night, Tommy Sands played a moving lament for Seamus at his wake. Tommy called him the last of the great Irish chieftains. Seamus Mallon, the last of the great Irish chieftains, having experienced, having experienced what he called the life waste and spirit waste of violence. The life waste and spirit waste of violence in the bloodstained 1970s and 80s had a different dream. His was a dream of justice, peace and reconciliation, and he played a lead role in bringing justice, peace and reconciliation to our shared home place. Seamus said, as I prepare to take my leave of our shared home place, I find comfort in an old Greek proverb. A society grows great when old men plant trees in whose shade they will never sit. What trees has Seamus Mallon planted? What trees has Seamus Mallon planted? I call Carol Boylan. Carl First of all, I'd like to also extend my condolences and sympathies to, to Orla and Mark and to Lara and to Seamus' sisters and to the extended family and also um, share and extend the loss with the SDLP. And we all know, uh, Mr Speaker, the great legacy now that, that Seamus Mann has left him and it's up to all of us, but more importantly the SDLP, to continue that legacy. Being a representative of the same constituency, uh, on occasion I would 
bump into uh, Seamus and uh, had an odd, robust conversation. He was a giant of a man and a man that you actually could learn from. And over the weekend there, when I talked to some of the constituents, to hold him in great esteem in, in the constituency yet. And I just want to say on behalf of the constituents uh, that I represent that um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mann was one of those people that won't be forgotten by them. But um, they also want to just extend uh, uh, words from the Mullerbrack JFC who done a, a job today and looking after the, the funeral arrangements and everything else for for the Mallon family. Those people have asked me to speak on their behalf and extend their thanks and recognise the contribution that Seamus Mallon has made on behalf of, in relation to the GA uh, Good Friday Agreement, in relation to his party, and just want to recognise that as contribution. Go on, Mr. I call John Dallet. Uh, Mr Speaker, in your introduction you said there are only nine left from the original assembly, hands up, I'm one of the nine. And it's with a great deal of pride and emotion that I rise to speak. I served with Seamus Mallon in the best of times and the worst of times. The best of times being the ability of the people of Northern Ireland to create a power sharing executive in 1998. And of course, the collapse of that assembly a few years later. At all times, Seamus was a statesman. He was a true and personal friend to me, but he was a friend to many other people in this assembly at that time from all political parties. Yes, the SDLP has lost one of the best, but I believe everyone has experienced a sense of loss, which is not really felt every day. Now, the best tribute we can make to Seamus is to finish the work which he began. And at least we forget that is in this chamber. I know Seamus was very happy this Assembly agreed uh, to be sitting again. Let us honour one of the greatest Irish men that ever lived. Let us take his advice and never collapse politics again uh, to create the risk that the men of violence may fill a vacuum which is not intended. That is important. That would be the greatest tribute we could pay, and I believe we will. This House has no longer just the legacy of unionism of the past, Craig Avon and, and all that. Seamus is very much the legacy of this House in modern times. So let us honour him and respect him. Let us adapt, adopt and protect that legacy with clarity and commitment to emulating his deeply held conviction that we must move on together. And I applaud the First Minister for saying that many times in recent times, and I hope everyone in this House is listening. Seamus has left the stage. May he rest in peace. And may more than these pictures hang on the walls of this building. Let us take his inspiration and legacy, and let us set about the difficult times ahead together in partnership. Seamus Mallon taught me to respect others. Let that be the experience of everyone in this House. I call Meg Nesbitt. Uh, Mr Speaker, I first uh, encountered Seamus Mallon about 35 years ago. I was the new presenter of Good Morning Ulster on BBC Radio. He was a recently installed Member of Parliament. To um, interview Seamus Mallon was challenging. Here is a man who knew his brief thoroughly, uh, knew his mind unquestionably, and knew exactly how to express an opinion. Oh, did he know how to express an opinion. Uh, and I was amazed he was still doing it in his 80s. Two years ago, I was at Queen's University watching him on a panel marking the 20th anniversary 
of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. In fact, he wasn't on the panel. He was dominating that panel. He was head and shoulders above the rest with his angry analysis of the missed opportunities and what had to come next. Uh, and I regret the missed opportunity of not visiting him more often in Market Hill. Uh, the last time was to discuss his memoir, A Shared Home Place, and I commend it to anybody who has not written it, gosh, who has not read it. And of course, in between times, his great work as a negotiator and a peacemaker. Let us not underestimate the thousands, in fact, the tens of thousands, of proud nationalists who wanted unity by consent and would never for a millisecond contemplate the use of violence. Those people looked to Seamus Mallon. And in 1998, I have no doubt that there is a group of people who said, if it's good enough for Seamus Mallon, then it's good enough for me. A true story, uh, if I may, Mr. Speaker, but I have to change one word to stay on the right side of parliamentary language, because he was a bit of a rascal. Uh, one morning, uh, I was told I had to interview him on Good Morning Ulster. And I looked at the subject matter, and I formed my strategy, which was very simple. I was going to wind him up. I was going to get a rise out of Seamus Mallon. But hard as I tried, and I gave him my best shots, he would not rise to the occasion. So the next day, most unusually, I discovered the SDLP were putting Seamus Mallon up as their spokesperson two days in a row. And just before we went live, the producer came into the studio and he said, look, I don't want this to alter how you're planning to do this interview. And I don't know what happened between you and Seamus Mallon yesterday morning, but when I got him up on the phone there, the first thing he said to me was, if that fellow tries to wind me up again today, I'm going to do him. Well, Mr. Speaker, I didn't. He did. And I loved him for it. I call Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, firstly, let me thank everybody in the House who has spoken so far and the kind words of comfort that have been extended to us, Seamus' SDLP colleagues. It means a lot on the day it is. I would like to join them in offering my sincerest of condolences to Orla, his daughter, Mark, his son-in-law and Princess Lara, as she's become known to us in recent times, but also to his sisters Maura, Jean and Kate and Marie Hart, who I understand was every bit the family member in caring for Seamus uh, throughout his illness. I would like to say that Seamus's life's work has proven that politics of coming together is the only type of politics that will ever benefit the people that we represent. His legacy of peacemaking, peacemaking is not one we should simply honour and celebrate. It goes further. It sets a standard for us all to live by and a standard we all should aspire to. Seamus Mallon played his part in making this place that we all call a shared home a better place. I thank him for it. Seamus was a good man, a man I was honoured to call my friend, and I thank him for all his efforts over the years in staring me. I was the recipient of that stare over the glasses on occasion that was referred to today, and it was always with good intent, and we will miss him terribly. Thank you, Seamus, for everything. May you rest in peace. I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I join uh, with uh, my colleagues in thanking all of you who took time today from your very busy diaries to attend Seamus's funeral service. It's very much appreciated. And could I also uh, say that uh, Seamus uh, was a man uh, that I was always delighted to listen to because I never had to guess what Seamus meant because I always knew exactly what he was saying because I'm sure many of you have been with politicians and with people and you're thinking, now, what did he really say? What did he mean by that? And you never had to worry about that. You got it straight. And I like uh, straight talking. And we all know that he liked uh, a little flutter. And I would hope that our ability here to work together in partnership and in creating the legacy of peace and partnership and power sharing is something that will prove many of the pundits wrong. 
uh, who, who seek to degrade uh, politics every day. I know uh, some of our own behaviours doesn't always aspire, but I find it very encouraging today when I heard people talk about, and the Archbishop talk about, the noble vocation of politics. And I think we should all take heart, because it is about service to the community. I know it was people like Seamus Mallon and that want to service and to, to help my neighbour that got me into politics. And I'm sure it is the same for many, if not all, of yourselves. And you'll all recall the most recent past with the terrible flags protest. And one of the things that stands out for me was when Seamus Mann chastised a lot of people when he said, stop poking each other in the eye. And perhaps when we go to speak in the future or when we want to make a contribution, we will hear that voice and moderate some of our language. I know we won't always agree and we will see things and have to articulate our viewpoint, but I think we should go from the base point of stop, stop poking each other in the eye. And Mr Speaker, if I might also take this opportunity, because I know my colleagues have thanked many who contributed to the organisation of the funeral service today, but can I uh, place on record our party's gratitude to the police service for the contribution that they made? I know they've worked very hard over the weekend and uh, today in what was a very bitterly cold day, and I'd like to thank that, uh, put, put on record our thanks. So thank you, Mr Speaker. Oh, I understand, Trevor Long. Sorry, Did, we didn't record your request. Uh, uh, thank you, that. Mr. Speaker. I wasn't aware if there was a list or if we had to rise in our seats, but uh, I've risen, so here we are. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't know Seamus Mallon personally, although perhaps we actually belong to the same generation, going by age at least. But I met him just once at a funeral. It was actually a funeral of one of our Banbridge councillors, Sheila McQuaid, and his uh, presence was very much appreciated at that time. I know also that attendance at the funerals of victims of violence was very important to him, and he made a point of attending all of them in his constituency. And that was surely a statement of his opposition to violence, implacable opposition to violence, on which he never wavered. My, my predecessor in Lagan Valley, the late and much Mr. James Close, knew him very well and spoke very fondly of him, even though they had political differences at times. But there was a good measure of personal friendship and respect between them. And that, that word respect, Mr Speaker, has been much used in recent days, both in terms of how Seamus Mallon treated others and in their attitude to him. Uh, people from across the political spectrum have commented over the weekend and today about his honesty, about his straight talking and his negotiating skills, which were used to such good effect over the years, as we all know. His partnership with John Hume was a formidable one, and there was no exaggeration, I'm sure, to say that without them, the Good Friday Agreement and perhaps other agreements might, might never have happened. He, uh, their legacy, and that of others I could mention, such as David Trimble, Dr Paisley, Jerry Adams, and others, is demonstrated in the fact that we're able to stand here today and talk about him in the Assembly, which has been reconstituted. And I, I totally agree with what John Dallet said. We, we cannot let this opportunity pass this time. He was, of course, a, a committed nationalist, uh, but at the same time, a realist, a realistic one who realised that it was necessary to reach out to unionists, and there wasn't any point in just banging a drum for the United Ireland. He appreciated the need for consent. Mr Speaker, I join with others in sending my sympathy and condolences to his family circle and to his SDLP colleagues who must be feeling it today. They have lost a great man. I understood, I understand, still providing insight and, <laughs> and sound advice until very recently. I heard Colm Eastwood this morning on the radio pass the comment along the lines of that when you were talking to Seamus, it wasn't always easy to tell if you were getting advice or telling off. Uh, but that's, that's the nature of straight talking, Mr Speaker. And maybe we need more of that in this place. May you rest in peace. I now call Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I would just like to follow from some of the tributes uh, made in this House and thank 
our colleagues across this chamber for their very sincere tribute to the memory of a great man. Uh, we do feel it today. We feel it. We felt it since Friday, and it's um, a very sore and painful point for us because we know fully the commitment and dedication and life work that she has put in to bringing about these institutions, paving the path to peace, the Good Friday Agreement, his relationship with Hume, to bring about a better future for everyone in this place. I speak as a new generation of the SDLP, and I'm surrounded by many on these benches that are sitting in more recent years, lucky, lucky to enjoy the peace the imperfect peace, but the peace that we have, thanks to the vision and life work of Seamus Mal. I sat today in the Mass and listened to the amazing tribute to his life. He had a profound influence on the lives of so many of us, and he certainly is a reason why I joined the SDLP, is a reason why I have loved the SDLP. And he's also a reason why me and others will be able to work and live together side by side across Northern Ireland. Seamus Mallon will, will, will never see the likes of him again. A truly inspirational man, a man of peace, a man of integrity, a man who's extremely blunt, and I heard Dolores say that she likes straight talkers. Well, Dolores, as many will know, was quite a blunt instrument herself at times. <laughs> I felt it important to uh, raise and, and just say a few words, and also to express my sincerest condolences to Arla, to his son-in-law, Mark, and to his little granddaughter, Lara, who he talked about so often. He was a family man, uh, and he cared very, very uh, deeply for them and loved spending time with them as well. John Dallet struck a very strong chord with me in his contribution and tribute to Seamus. We have so much to learn from the man that sat on these benches some years before us. Working together, reaching out for the greater good, for the common good of everyone here. And this is a shared home place. So, I'd just like to really put on record my heartfelt sympathies to his family, to his friends, and also to the entire constituency of Newry and Armagh, who will feel uh, the pain of this loss uh, very much, and thank the members of this House. And I will say that today, as I stood waiting on uh, Seamus's remains to come to the church, I was met with the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister, and I watched as they walked down the road together. And today I can actually say I think there is some hope for this place and for the future. And I'd like to thank you for that very strong symbol that was shown today. I'm sure Seamus was smiling down, going, God, I can bring them together. So thank you to everyone and those who attended and paid tribute. May you rest in peace. I call Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this weekend I had business to do in Connemara in a little town called Clifton. And Clifton would be the old seat of the British in the west of Ireland. It's an absolutely beautiful little place. And during the summer, uh, Seamus went down to open the Art Festival Week. And as I walked around that town over the weekend, so many people come up to me and they have fond memories of him. Um, I rang uh, yesterday my colleague Justin McNulty in order to try and convey that message on, but I was lucky enough when I got to the house this morning. And when we arrived at that house uh, this morning on, uh, in Mullabrack, it reminded me so much of where I come from, a little place outside Moreland, Kilwarlin, and that also would be a predominantly unionist constituency. And yes, people here have already said about the coming together of that community, but all of them came together in order to have that fitting send off and that place set. And farmers opened up their fields. Locals come out, the GAA club come out, and neighbours of Seamus, regardless of religions, were there in order to help them. And that fits into to my feeling of 
of this one community which we all are. And I'm very lucky and privileged uh, to be here today. And Daniel, unfortunately, when you come after maybe so many people, you lose the, the chance maybe to say something. But I, like Daniel, noticed our First Minister and our Deputy First Minister. And uh, Connor was with them, our Finance Minister, went down there as well today. And that filled me full of hope because it reminded me of the story of that terrible incident, and I don't really want to speak on it in points past, and when my neighbour, David Trimble, along with Seamus Mallon, walked down uh, points past to the murder of those two young friends. And I thought, again, what a gesture we had today. And Seamus always filled me with this word, hope. And I thought, today, I was filled with hope when I seen our First Minister and our Deputy First Minister walking down that country loaning for the better of the water, for the want of a better word, on the crossroads at Mullabrack. And for that, Mr Speaker, I was glad to be at that service today and to be rejoiced and, and, and to feel uplifted to be there. And on this occasion, I also wish to pass on my sympathies to the Mallon family, to Ireland, to Mark and to his little granddaughter and to all of my colleagues here uh, that, that, that uh, served with Seamus. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That concludes the tributes to former Deputy First Minister, Mr. Seamus Mallon. I now propose by leave of the Assembly to suspend the sitting until 6 p.m. and invite members to join me in sending a book of condolence. The sitting is by leave suspended. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme Sound. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary Programme signed. This 